start from the current slide, which is actually, if it will start from it, there we go, uh, <laughs> is in 5.3. And I may even turn on the projector. I don't know. You should be able to visualize what I'm talking about, right? Okay. And here's Sarah. Let's see. Okay. I was just going to start with the announcements. You've heard them all before, but I want to keep harping on them. Hopefully, you'll respond one of these days. The math team still looking for people. You are prime candidates for it. Okay. Uh, they meet every Friday, pretty much every Friday at noon on the Birmingham West Campus, the Science Building, which is the C Hall in room C100. That's the, when you come out of the library building into C Hall, it's the first room on the left when you come through that, past that uh, stairwell there. Then they meet same place at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. And the guy in my Monday, Wednesday class that's participating with that said they were having a lot of fun and really learning math. And I can tell because he started the course sort of hesitant. And now he's on top of it. He's just, he's answering before anybody else. So uh, I can tell it's doing him a lot of good. He said he's really learning math well and fun. Okay. Um, and then the tutoring schedule. I don't think either any of you need tutoring that I can tell. But I think you would be great tutors if you want to participate. Down the hall here in room 202 is the SSS tutoring lab. Now, they don't have a full-time person in there anymore. Uh, Miss uh, Martin, uh, Cicely Martin, is sometimes in there, but she's not the coordinator of the tutoring lab. Uh, that coordinator, I think, uh, moved on to a different job somewhere else. Uh, so you might have to go all the way around the corner to see Miss Sh 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 Sharon Harris uh, to, to set up to uh, tutor. Um, but if Miss Martin's in there, she'd probably help you too. Then downstairs in, in 105 is the Space Center tutoring, and both of the places pay pretty good well for tutoring. And uh, I know the one up here is very flexible on your hours. You set it up with the person you're assigned to tutor, and you, that's all you have to do. The one downstairs, I think you have to be there certain hours in the day, but you again, you set it up, up according to your schedule. Okay, and uh, just a little piece of information, I got the first of the second test in, uh, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, so keep those coming. And on the same vein, oh, this has to be one of my best classes, right? And yet, zero research papers turned in yet? I can't believe it, right? I don't see a score down there. I see some test one scores, but no research paper scores. So please try to get those in, too. All right. Now, <clears throat> we were doing example six on page, in, in 5.2 on page 359. First, are there any questions before I get going? Okay. Uh, Oh, okay. So she's probably not going to be here today, or okay. I thought maybe it was just running late. And then I said I didn't make my announcement. Uh, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this that I have office hours on the Birmingham campus from 7:45 to 11:45 on Fridays. I have hardly been there for the last several weeks. Okay, I had at least four infusions, one meeting. And one Friday I was there, you know, out of the last month and a half, I've probably only been there one time, okay? And tomorrow's no exception, okay? I have a, my annual physical tomorrow with a different doctor, and uh, that's tomorrow. It seems like it starts about 8 or something. So if I get through with the doctor in time, then I'll be heading to the Birmingham campus. But if I don't get through in time, I probably won't, okay? So, but I will be missing part of my office office hours there 
because I won't be there at 745 and I probably won't be there at 845. Maybe there by 945 or 10 if everything goes quickly and smoothly. So I meant to say that too. So let's move on to, yeah, this will be a good place. Uh, this is still 5.2 even though that says 5.3. Um, something we've been doing all along, working with each side separately, uh, says verify this identity. Cosine, uh, I'm, I'm, cotangent, I can't read. Okay. Cotangent squared theta over 1 plus cosecant theta. Okay. Supposedly is equal to, that's a question mark there, 1 minus sine theta over sine theta. Now, um, of all the examples to say working with them separately, this is one I would just work with the left hand side. Uh, you probably are going to need to do something with the right hand side, but I can't think of much. I can think of one thing and we probably will have to do it. So let's focus on the left hand side. Ooh, yeah. What would be your suggestion of how to get started there? What's problematic there? Second? I can't hear you. Yes, uh, I think the conjugate is going to be a good idea. My question is whether we start now. But since you brought it up, let's do it. So, and we may have to do that the right-hand side too, but not yet. So what is the conjugate of that denominator? 1 minus cosecant theta. Okay, but if we multiply that, we'll also multiply here. 1 minus cosecant theta. Okay. So, that leaves in your numerator. Goodness, my eyes are stinging. Uh, 1 minus cosecant theta times cotangent squared theta. Okay. And then the denominator, what do you have? Cosecant squared theta. Okay. We're going to leave the right side alone for now. Okay. Now, did that help us any? What is 1 minus... Say again? Okay, then you get back to what you had to begin with. So, yeah. So let's not say we did. Okay. Uh, does that look a little familiar? What does that kind of look like? Yeah, it sure looks like it could be related to Pythagorean identity. So if I don't remember my signs and what to do with them, well, usually what I go back to the things I do know. And I do know that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal 1. I know that, okay, without a doubt. And since we've got a cosecant squared, what is cosecant squared? Okay, yeah, not that. It's, a cosecant is 1 over sine. So therefore, let's divide this by sine squared theta. So we wind up with a cosecant squared theta, right? So if we divide that one, we need to divide this one too, which is divide that by sine squared theta and divide this by sine squared theta. This is sort of backward going through it since I wanted to have a cosecant squared and I don't need a sequel sign there. Okay, so what is sine squared over sine squared? One. What's cosine squared over sine squared? 
cotangent squared theta. Hey, that may have some advantage, huh? And what is 1 over sine squared? Cosecant squared theta, right? Now, they have a 1 minus, so what I'm going to do is subtract the cosecant squared theta from both sides, right? I'm letting what we've got over here guide where I'm going over here. So that goes away. Well, I don't want a zero over there, so let's subtract a cotangent squared theta from both sides as well. And this gives us, that goes to zero, so this is 1 minus cosecant squared theta is equal to minus cotangent squared theta, right? So this is going to become a minus cotangent squared theta. So the cotangent squareds can go out and you're left with a minus out front, okay? Now, since you have a minus out front, let's just change that to being cosecant theta minus 1. You're just negating that flipping them around. Now, the question is, does that look anything like that? Not quite yet. So what might you try next? Say again? Yes! Let's write this in terms of sine and cosine. And what does that become? 1 over sine theta. minus 1, right? Okay, now let's go to the right-hand side. This is already in a decent fractional form, monomial in the denominator, so let's just split this to be 1 over sine theta minus sine theta over sine theta, which happens to be 1. We've done it. Both sides are the same. So we did have to do a little bit there, but not very much. Okay? Uh, it was already in terms of sines and cosines. I already had a monomial denominator. It was in pretty good shape. This one took a little work. But it wasn't too bad. All right, good deal. Any questions on that one? Now, I'm pretty sure they didn't do it the same way I did. <laughs> they seldom do, but... Uh, Uh, in fact, ah, uh, no, yeah, what they did is started with the cotangent squared theta and rewrote that with a Pythagorean identity as uh, cosecant squared theta minus one and then factored that and wind up getting the same place, okay? Uh, maybe theirs was a little easier, but maybe a little shorter, but you started seeing that with the conjugate, so we went with it, and it worked well. There is a checkpoint there, well worth your effort to look at the checkpoint. So let's move on to example seven. Can I erase this now? All right. Two examples from calculus. I'm going to verify some identities here. Here's one. Tangent fourth x. They're asking, or wanting us to verify, that that's the same as tangent squared x times secant squared x minus tangent squared x. All right, it's having trouble writing, but it got it done. Where would you begin? You could do that, and certainly that is a possibility. 
Let's do it and see what happens. I think there's a slightly easier way, but let's try it. Tangent fourth is it's sine to the fourth x over cosine to the fourth x. All right. And on the right-hand side, this is sine squared x over cosine squared x times, and what's secret? 1 over, say again, cosine squared minus, and this will just be a sine squared x over cosine squared x. Okay? Now, where do you want to go from there? And it's quite doable. Say again? Don't know. Okay. Uh, you could proceed this way. I think there was a little bit easier step to do in the first. So we don't have to give up on this, but if you want to, we can. It doesn't hurt, okay? It only takes a little time. So let's try something else first, okay? And I'm going to go back to one of their first questions. What is the more complicated looking side? The which? The right side. I agree with you on that. Now, there is a little bit you could argue, well, the left side is at a higher power, so in a sense it's more complicated, but the right side has more terms, more yeah, things. So what can we do to the right-hand side as sort of a first step to do something? It's an algebraic expression in trig functions, right? And what can we, what do we usually look for to simplify an algebraic expression? Fine. Factor! And what can you factor here? On the right. Any common factors? Say again? I know they're all square, but are any of them common? What? Tangent squared. So let's factor that out. Okay? So let's factor out a tangent squared x. Okay? And what do you have left? Secret squared x minus 1. Right? Now, any little bells start going off in your head? Yeah, so Pythagorean identity, secret squared x minus 1. Anyone remember what it is? If not, we can go back to the original and figure it. Want to go to the original? Okay. So let's go to, what's that original? Sine squared x plus cosine squared x is always equal to 1. And we're trying to get a secret squared out of that, so what's a secret? 1 over cosine. So let's do divide this by cosine squared x. So we'll divide this by cosine squared x, and we'll divide that by cosine squared x. All that's legal, right? <coughs> okay. What's sine squared over cosine squared? Tangent squared x. That's looking promising. Plus 1 equal secant squared x, and then if we want to get a secant squared x minus 1, we just subtract 1 here and 1 there, don't we? And what does that give us? Tangent squared x is equal to secant squared x minus 1. That was one of the identities in one form or another, but now we can put, instead of secant squared x, write it as you already had a tangent squared x there, and secant squared x minus 1 is another tangent squared x, and what does that give us? Tangent to the fourth x, which is exactly what we have on the right. Oh, well. Right, left, right, right. What's that? That way it was a lot easier. Yeah, I think so. You could have done the other the way you did it, but then you've been factoring out a sine squared over cosine squared. Just get a little messier. It still would have worked. 
but when you can keep from complicating it, usually it's better. So that's the A one here. Let's do the B one. So if we get that on the bottom side, here we have a cosecant to the fourth x times a cotangent to the fourth x, supposedly equal to, or we're investigating, trying to verify to see if that's cosecant squared x times yuck. Yuck. There we go. Cotangent x plus cotangent cubed x. All right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Where are we going to go with this? Several routes you could take. What would you like to try first? I miscopied the problem. I was going to say that does not look promising. I put a 4 in there that wasn't there, okay? Now this is looking a little bit better. All right. <laughs> Big difference. Okay. Factoring. Is anything factorable? Yeah. This term right here has a common factor of cotangent x, which happens to be a factor over here too, so that looks like a promising derivative. So let's start with that and ooh, I gotta get my pen back. I gotta get my pen back. There it is. Okay. All right, so this cosecant squared x stays just like it is. Okay, now we're going to factor out of that expression a cotangent x. And what does that leave us in that expression? 1 plus cotangent squared x. Okay, anything there look like it might ring a bell. Say again? Identity, and which one do you see? One plus cotangent squared is what? Absolutely, that's cosecant squared. So this is cosecant squared x that we had times cotangent x that we factored out, and for some reason my it's not working at all. There it is. And this becomes a cosecant squared x here. And what does that give us? Cosecant squared times cosecant squared is cosecant to the fourth. Yep, there it is. Write it down if you want to. That's equal to cosecant fourth x times cotangent x, which is exactly what the left-hand side is. Make sense? Okay. That end, and by the way, there's some checkpoints down there. Well worth your time and effort to look at those. So let's do vocabulary in 5-2. In the first two here, we're just going to fill in blanks. Actually, the others were our two. They're just different kinds of things. This is a sentence. An equation that is true for all real values in the domain of the variable is an identity. That's what we've been doing, verifying identities. Number two, an equation that is true for only some values in the domain of a variable, of the variable, is a blank blank. The second word is based on the word 
equals 5. Okay, if you want to, you can go back to page 355. Oh, you may not have your book available. But that very first paragraph, that, no, second paragraph there, remember that a conditional equation, that's what it is. Equal sign equation. That is, that's what I was trying to get at. A conditional equation. All right, let me mark, share it here. Okay, so Sydney won't be here, so we've got our quorum. Okay. All right, moving on to number three. In these next six, three through eight, fill in the blank to complete the fundamental trigonometric identity. One over cotangent is tangent u. Okay, number four. Cosine u over sine u is cotangent u. Number five, cosine of pi halves minus u. Cosine of pi halves minus u. In other words, it's the cosine of the complement of u. That would be the co-function of cosine, which would be, drop the co. Sine. sine of u. That's it. Sine of u. Number six. One plus blank is cosecant squared u. Cotangent squared u. Number seven. This is on page 360 if you got your book. Number seven. Cosecant of minus u is what? has to do with even or oddness. So what kind of function is cosecant squared? It's so cosecant u. What is the reciprocal of? Sine. sine. And what is sine, even or odd? I think of how sine looks. It starts at zero, right? Goes up this way, but down this way. It's odd. So therefore, the secret must be odd. Because it's reciprocal. And therefore, if it's odd, the cosine co of negative u would be the odd. If sine goes up and down here, a negative u would be the opposite of the positive u. This is the sign, sign sign for cosecant, but that would be negative cosecant u. Right? Okay. Number eight. Secant of minus u would be what? Secant of u, because secant happens to be an even function because it's the reciprocal of cosine, which is the even function. Cosine starts at 1 and goes down. Here, here, it's the same on both sides. Cos cos cosine of minus u is the same as cosine of positive u. Always the same. So therefore, it's an even function. So secant would be two. So secant of minus u would be secant of positive all right, homework exercises. There would be any of the odds 9 through 17. They're all at calpchat.com. 9 is a calp view. Do any of the odds 19 to 23. They're all at calp chat. 21 is at calp view. Do any of the odds 25 to 29. They're all at calp chat. 27 is at calp view. Do any of the odds 31 to 35, they're all at Calc Chat. 33 is at Calc View. Goodness gracious. <clears throat> My head's closing up on it. Do any of the odds 37 to 41, they're all at Calc Chat, but 41's at Calc View. 
Then they have an error analysis. I really don't care for these too much because they're, they're incorrect, but they tell you that it's incorrect, asking you to figure out what's, how you correct uh, or describe the error. So if you want to do 43, you can. Okay? Then do any of the odds 45 to 49. They're all at Calc Chat. None of them are at Calc View. Do either 51 or 53. They're both at Calc Chat, but 51's at Calc View. Sorry. Ugh. Oh, man. Do 55. It's at Calc Chat, but not at Calc View. Do 57 or 59. They're both at Calc Chat. 57's at Calc View. You can do 61. It's at Calc Chat. As far as I know, it is. Then there's 63 is a true false. Uh, you just answer that. And uh, 67 or 69, you can work either of those. All right. Any questions on 52? Right, let's move on to 53. Okay. I'll go back one slide just to show you. It's still Chapter 5, Analytic Trigonometry. And 53 is Solving Trigonometric Equations. Okay, we've done a little of this before, now we're going to do a little bit more. We'll use standard algebraic techniques to solve trigonometric equations. And as we saw in some of the last few in identities, those techniques, the algebraic techniques, work with trig equations too. Just get used to, rather than do it to a variable, do it to a trig function. Okay, solve trigonometric equations of a quadratic type. We've been doing some of those. We'll do even more. Solve trigonometric equations involving multiple angles. That's something a little bit new, but I think you'll see it's pretty straightforward. And then we'll use inverse trigonometric functions to solve trigonometric equations. Um, and we have done some inverses, haven't we, in Chapter 4? I can't remember. I'm doing... Precalculus algebra, calculus, and this, and I can't remember which we've done what to. Okay. So the introduction here is to solve a trigonometric equation. Use the standard algebraic techniques when possible, such as collecting like terms and factors. I want to back off a step here. When you're solving a trigonometric equation, what you're doing first is solving for the trig function. See, in a regular algebraic equation, you solve for the variable, right? Okay, you solve for the variable. You isolate the variable. You do whatever it needs to, to deal with the variable. With a trig function, okay, if there's algebraic manipulation of trig functions, then you solve for the trig function first, and then solve for the variable, okay? I think that would have been, to me, that would clarify this a little bit. You collect like terms of the variables, and, uh, of the functions, factor, do that kind of stuff, with the functions, not with the variable, with the functions. Your preliminary goal in solving a trigonometric equation is to isolate the trig function on one side of the equation or the other. Just like you try to isolate the variable, now you do it to functions. Once you get them isolated, then you solve for the variable. For example, to solve this equation here. This is a real simple equation. 2 sine x is equal to 1. Well, the first thing we want to do is solve for the sine x. Not x, but sine x. So therefore, we clear out everything else, which would be what? Trying to isolate the sine x, what do we need to do? Divide by 2. And that would give you sine x is equal to 1 half. Divide by 2, and you get less. Now we can solve for, for, for x. What are the values of x that we can take the sign of it? And those are going to be angles, right? If they're in radians, they're just whole numbers, but they're uh, real numbers. But uh, what are the values where the sign of that angle is 1 half? Here is where I try to recall my little unit circle deal. Okay. 
Ooh, that's not very pretty. Sine of zero is... Sine of zero is... Zero. It's the square root of zero over two, which, of course, is zero. Okay? Now, we have the our favorite little angles here. This is pi halves up here. And sine of pi halves is... 1, which is the square root of 2 over 2. No, it's the square root of 4 over 2. Because square root of 4 is 2, and 2 over 2 is 1. Okay? So you see square root of 0 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. So this would be the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2. And this would be the square root of 3 over 2. It's just a little device to me that makes it easier to remember. Well, what are those angles here? Which is the one that's going to be one half? Square root of one is one, so this is going to be one half. What angle is that? These are our favorite angles, the one we deal with all the time. Second, 30 or pi 6, whichever you choose. So x is going to be 30 or degrees or pi 6. In the book, they call it pi 6. So x equal Pi six. Now, is that the only place where sine has a value of one half? Sine is positive in first, obviously everything's positive there, and second quadrant. So again, over here, you're going to have a sine of one half because the opposite is the vertical, is the y value. Over a five. Now, this isn't a unit circle, this is a two circle. I'm sorry, I should have said a two circle. Okay, with a two circle, but not a very pretty two circle either. So, this is going to be pi six short of pi, which would be five six pi. So, there's the other place. Or x equal five pi over six. Now, everywhere else down here is negative, okay? So it's not, never going to be one half again. But because this can go around and around and around and around and around and around, we need to add 2 in pi here and 2 in pi here. To make it our general solution, that would be plus 2 in pi. And this would also be plus 2 in pi, okay? where n is any integer. Positive or negative, zero, doesn't matter. It'll work. Okay? So there's your general solution. Right? Because <laughs> you picture the sine function. Okay? And if you do x equal one half, that'd be halfway between zero and one. It's going to cross here and here and here and here and here. Yeah, because every time it's up or low, it's going to have one on the upside and one on the downside. Pi 6 and pi pi 6. The one forever. So there's your general solution. Now, what I was just sort of arm waving about there, here's a picture of it. Here's your sine curve. The sine starts at 0, goes up to 1 at pi half, down to 0 at pi, down to minus 1 at pi, 3 halves pi, up to 0 at 2 pi, which is one period later, and then up here and down. Down and up and down. Ah, oh, keep going forever. Or where x y is equal to one half, sine x equal one half, that would be here and here, here and here, here and here, here and here, here and here. Okay, keep going forever in both directions. Okay, well, where is that going to be? This is in your pi six and your five pi six. Now, they are a certain distance apart, but it's not a uniform distance, so this and that are not the same. So it's this one plus 2 in pi, this one minus 2 in pi, this one plus 2 in pi, and this one minus 2 in pi. So that's why we do them separately. <coughs> pi 6 plus 2 in pi, and pi pi 6 over 2 in pi. Not plus 2 in pi. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry.
combination of several things, end of the week, treatment, loss of sleep last night because I've had some other issues with the treatment. It's just I'm running out, running out of gas here. All right. Moreover, because sine X has a period of 2 pi, there are infinitely many other solutions. So once you find the pi 6, then do 2 n pi plus 2 n pi plus 2 n pi. Yeah, 2 pi plus 2 pi plus 2 n number of times. And n can be negative or 0. And same thing with the 5 pi 6. Okay? Now, here was our circle figure. That's the way I was first imagining it. The uh, figure below illustrates another way to show that the equation sine x equal one half has infinitely many solutions. Any angles that are coterminal with pi six or five and five pi six. All right. <clears throat> oh man, I'm so clogged up I can hardly breathe. Uh, will also be solutions of the equation when solving trigonometric equations, you should write your answers using exact values rather than decimal approximations. In other words, that came out pi 6. If you would have written that as a decimal approximation, that would have been 0.5 something, 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 something. Okay? And then the next one would have been <clears throat> oh, something fairly close to five thirds, is that right? Yeah, no. Oh, Uh, yeah, well, five halves, something close to, to five halves, okay? That would have been something close to one half, this would have been something close to uh, five halves, and uh, I'm not doing that right, I'm not thinking well right now at all. something close to five halves, which wouldn't have been easy to recognize either, and then adding two pi to it, which is another 6.28 blah blah blah, is no real clear what your pattern is. It has a pattern, it's just hard to see. If you keep it in pi's, it's real easy to see the pattern. Okay. So that's why they say, rather than doing a decimal, decimal approximation, write it in terms of pi's. You know, other cases, it might be square roots rather than writing the decimal of root 3, say, or something like that. All right. Goodness gracious. I think I'm going to have to pause, go down and clear my head. I don't think I can make it a half hour. Would not. All right, what was your approach on this? Here's an equation, not in a variable, though it has a variable in it, but in a function. So what did you do to try to solve that equation? So again, how do you do that? Add, add a sign to both sides, okay? Okay, and what does that give you? 2 sine x plus the square root of 2 is equal to 0. Well, that's not very fun, is it? So what might you also want to do? Say again? Subtract this root 2. Is that what I'm hearing? I don't hear well. Okay. Scrack root 2 from both sides. That was scrack is subtract. Okay. The square root of 2 from both sides. That goes out here. So now we have 2 sine x is equal to negative root 2. Okay? Now what? 
Ah, divide by 2, because we're trying to isolate the sine x. So divide both sides by 2. So now we have sine x is equal to negative the square root of 2 over 2. Now, what values of x could possibly give you that? Okay. Uh, you know in the first quadrant, it's never negative. In the second quadrant, it's never negative. But in the third quadrant, at your quarter pi in the third quadrant, we'll set that pi here plus one quarter pi would be five quarter pi. Four quarter pi plus one quarter pi is five quarter pi. So sine, so x would be five pi over four. Okay, with lots of writing. Okay, now is that the only one? No, you go over to the fourth quadrant and have another place where you find that. And where do you find that there? Seven, seven pi over four, one quarter pi short of two pi. Two pi would be eight quarter pi, so this would be, so, or x equal seven pi fourths. Because sine is negative down there in the lower half of the your circles, okay? But, since you didn't have anything limiting what values of x you might have here, it can go around and around and around and around. So, to each of these we add 2 and pi. And it's 2 and pi because the period for sine is 2 pi. And every time you do one more period, you're back where you started from. Okay, so it's 2 n pi, or 2 pi n. Okay, good deal. Can I go and erase it? Oh, man, breathing a little better, but not much. All right, so how do they do? Begin by isolating the sine x on both sides of the equation. Yeah, so they just wrote it down. And you try to get your variables on one side, in this case the functions with the variable on one side, and everything else on the other side. So they did it, nope, they added first, got a zero, and then they subtracted the minus pi halves, and why they have sine x plus sine x, and I'll just go and call it two sine x, I'm not sure, but that's how they do. Two sine x is equal to negative root two, then divide Again, you're isolating the variable, the function first, and then the variable next. So isolate the function, it's going to be divided by 2. Sine x is negative root 2 over 2. And then we just have to do our figuring. Because sine x has a period of 2 pi, first find all the solutions in one period, 0 to 2 pi, and then add a 2 n pi to it. Well, from 0 to pi, there aren't any negative signs. So we don't go there, but then once you get past pi, you have all your <laughs> sides are negative until you get to 2 pi. So you want the two places there that's negative pi half, 1 half, and second time it's negative 1 half. So those solutions are your quarter pi is down there, which is 5 quarters pi in the third quadrant, 7 quarters pi fourth quadrant, um, and then you add multiples of 2 pi, which is 2 n pi, to each of those solutions. And that gives you n is any n pi. Okay. All right, that was example one. There is a checkpoint for one, well worth your effort to do. Okay. They're skipping example two. Shame on them. All right, so let's do example two here. <sighs> I don't know. All right, solve this. Three tangent squared x minus one is equal to zero. Kind of an interesting kind of problem there. 
seems like this one should have been done on the slideshow because it's a bit more involved than the last one was. What would be a few things that would come to mind on this one? Anything particular? Okay. Sounds like you're isolating the, uh, the function. I think that may be a good idea. That's certainly something I would try to do. So let's add one to both sides. And that gives you 3 tangent squared x. Those go to 0 equal to 1. Next. Divide both sides by 3 to further isolate the function. So divide by 3. And the 3's go out. And you have tangent squared x equal one third. All right. Now what? Hey, yeah, let's do a square root of both sides. Now, when you do that, remember you're going to wind up with a plus or minus. So that will give you tangent x equal plus or minus the square root of 1 over 3. Okay? But I'm going to simplify the, I'm going to squeal. I don't know. Simplify that a little bit because square root of 1 is 1. So this can also be written as plus or minus the 1 over root 3. But a lot of times we don't like to have a root 3 in the, I mean a radical in the denominator. So how could you simplify that a little bit to make it rational in the denominator? Is that plus or minus root 3 over 3? All right. So the tangent of x is equal to that. Where in the world does that happen? Would it be helpful to draw a 3 circle? I think so. So I'm going to draw a circle first, or as close as I can get to one, then try to draw that, and then try to make it a 3. Nope. Okay. Don't know how good that is, but anyway, we got it. <coughs> no, I don't want a 3 circle. If that had been a sine or a cosine, I would want a three circle. I don't want a three circle here because what is a tangent? What is tangent? Taking notes away. Opposite over adjacent. So the, and now it doesn't really matter which one you use. You could use 1 and root 3 or root 3 and 3, I, I, whichever floats your boat. Let's go back to the 1 and root 3, okay? So the opposite side is 1, and the adjacent side is root 3, if you, if you use this form here. So in other words... 1 squared plus root 3 squared is equal to your hypotenuse squared, right? x squared plus y squared is going to be your hypotenuse squared, right? Now you use opposite being 1 and adjacent being root 3, which is y and x. So our hypotenuse is going to be that. Just looking at that, can you tell me what it'll be? And that would be 2 squared. 1 plus root 3 squared is equal to 2 squared. So your hypotenuse is 2, right? So I need a two-circle, not a three-circle. Okay. <coughs> now. Now. 
uh, your opposite side is your one, right? Taking those away. So that side is one, and this is root three here, right? So one is the opposite side, and root three is the adjacent side. And your hypotenuse is two. So this is your angle X right there. I kind of don't like X's because you think of that as on the horizontal axis. No, X is an angle here, not that. Where are we, folks? Say again. First question, yeah, for sure. Uh, are we guaranteed that? I'm, no, no. That's just using the plus one here. Okay. Uh, but not even that, because you deal with the tangent, which you can also be in this here. But I mean, how far above that axis? What is your angle X there? Had it earlier when you're when we're dealing with sines. Say it. The sine of that angle X would be one over two, right? Pasta over a partner. When sine is one half, where are you? What's your angle? Square root of zero over. Two square root of one over two square root of two over two square root of three over two square root of four over two. It's the first angle you get to in our favorites. Thirty or pi thirds. I mean pi six. Pi six. So. The first place here will be x equal pi 6, right? Okay. Now, remember tangent has a period of what? Tangent. Sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi. Tangent has a period of pi because you go through the whole sequence. You see, tangent is this is just part of it plus minus then plus minus. So you get through everything by the time you're here, and then you just repeat it going back. Okay, so it will be pi six plus n minus one. Okay. Okay, now where else is tangent either plus or minus one over root three? Be a minus when it's over here, would it? Because tangent is minus in the second quadrant, the same reference angle. Okay, so what would that one be? Pi six short of. Uh, pi. Five, six, yeah. So five pi over six plus n pi. Okay? Now, the other two are just going to be multiple to pi. This one would be the extension of this. That would just be pi plus this. So that's covered. And the other would be over here, which is pi plus that. So that's covered. So here again, we've been there, done that, haven't we? Okay, for totally different reasons, but those are our answers here. Same as we had for the uh, that first sign that we did. Exhale, those were plus 2 n pi, this is n pi. So it's not quite the same. Make sense? So that was example 2. There is a checkpoint well worth you doing the checkpoint. Okay? They also skip example three. So let's, can I erase this one? Okay. Erase example 
2 and go to example 3. Man. I've got stacks of grading to do and I feel so lousy. This is not, and then I have a four and a half hour class this afternoon. So <laughs> if I drag home tonight, I may sleep through the doctor's visit tomorrow. Okay, let's do example three. Solve this equation. Oh my word. Cotangent x times cosine squared x equal to cotangent, I'm sorry, x. Keep wanting to write thetas, but it's an x. All right. Uh -oh. What's an added complication in this problem? Yeah, you got two different trig functions, okay? And that would be like trying to solve an equation with two different variables in it. You know, x's and y's. Sometimes those are really hard to do. So, um, what you can do is get all your trig functions on one side and zero on the other. And since they are separable, by factoring, you can live with that, I think, can't we? So what would be the first thing we would try to do? Subtract a 2 cotangent x from both sides. Okay, I shouldn't have written that under that. That's this is going to go to zero. So what we have here is cotangent x cosine squared x minus 2 cotangent x is equal to zero. Okay? Now what? And again here, sort of think in terms of... Uh, as if these trig functions were variables. So if this was, say, a x, y squared minus 2x, or maybe it should be that, a, b squared minus 2a equals 0, what could you do? Factor out an a. In this case, that's a cotangent. So let's factor out a cotangent. And what does it leave you with? Cosine squared x minus second okay I couldn't hear still cosine so no you factored out the cotangent so you're left here with just a a 2, right? And that's equal to 0, right? Okay with it? All right. So this then is going to, here we have two factors, and the product problem is equal to 0. The only way that could be true is if one or the other was equal to 0, right? Yay. Okay, so that would be either cotangent x is equal to 0 or cosine squared x minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay, let's just hold off the cotangent x for a moment. What can you do to solve here? Maybe add 2 to both sides. And this will give you cosine squared x is equal to 2, right? Which would be 
cosine x would equal plus or minus the square root of 2. All right? All right, that side over here. Okay, so let's go back here. What is cotan to x? Your ratio identity or your quotient identity? What would that be? Cotan. Cosine over sine. Now, if you got cosine over sine, how's the only way you're going to get that equals zero? What would have to be zero? Your cosine. That numerator would have to be zero. Well, where is cosine equal to zero? Where does it start? At one. And it falls to zero at... I has minus 1 at pi, right? So it's 0 at pi halves, and then again at 3 halves pi, 5 halves pi, 7 halves pi, and back this way too. So it's at all your half pi's, right? That's where it's equal to 0. So x would then be pi halves plus n pi, because it happens every pi. Happens to be that way. And cotangent is a uh, period of pi. Okay? Right? How about the next one? Where is cosine equal to plus or minus root t? I'm real tempted to have you punch that in the calculator to see what plus or minus root t is. So punch it in the calculator and see what root t is. Does anyone know approximately right off the top? This is a, an approximation. Makes it look like it's a rational expression, but it's not. It's 1.41. Right? About 1.41, right? Zero to three. Now, try taking an inverse cosine of that number. What you get? Huh? Okay, third two is 1.414, right? Take the inverse cosine of that. What do you get? Say again? Error! What's wrong with this picture? Say again? It's greater than 1 or less than minus 1. Cosine's always got to be between plus or minus 1. It can't possibly be root 2, which is 1.414. This cosine squared can't possibly be 2. The most it could be would be 1. The most it could be because every value. So that doesn't give you any possible answer. So here you're talking That's an n pi. It looks like a 2 pi, but that's an n pi. Pi halves plus n pi. Okay. Yep. Yes. Pardon me? Okay, I don't have it up. Well, maybe I do have it up here right now. Yeah. Okay. Second? Yeah, I know, but uh Is there a class next door? Huh? There is next door. Okay. How about down the hall in two fifty one? You know. Huh?
don't mean it, do you? I was going to say, I wonder why she came during class. Her class was over. Okay. Uh, let's finish this one. Well, I think we just did. There is a checkpoint there at the bottom of the page. So try to do that one as well. And we will start next time with equations of the quad quadratic type, which I'm going to do right there so it'll come up next time. Let's do, let me give you the homework assignments. We didn't get as far in 5.3 as I would have liked. Uh, I think you can do any of the odds 5 through 9. And I think you can do any, and they are all at calcchat.com. I think you can do any of the odds 11 through 27, and they're at calcchat.com. And 13's at calcview.com. And let's see. We haven't limited that yet, so let's stop there and we'll we'll pick up the rest of those later. Okay. Alright, good deal. Alright, sorry I was having breathing problems, but uh glad y'all had something to work on while I went down.